Hello and welcome to the special. The digital space has witnessed major transformation in the last couple of years. Monopolies have been busted, new leaders have emerged, and the internet is changing industry like never before. What are the new frontiers going ahead? Well, to discuss this and the internet of things, joining me today are Sanjay Kaul, the CTO of Cisco in India, R. Chandrasekhar, the president of NASCOM, Manoranjan Mohapatra, the CEO of Mahindra Comviva, and Nigel Eastwood, CEO of New Call Telecom. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining me today. Mr. Chandrasekhar, let me start off with you. You know, the Internet of Things throws up tantalizing uh, opportunities and lots of avenues for crystal ball gazing. Now, as the president of NASCOM, uh, you have a fair sense and perhaps uh, the best view on how uh, technology is breaking through new frontiers and getting adapted into uh, more traditionally untouched areas. Why don't we start by you giving us a quick sense of how Internet of Things is changing things, really? Yeah, I think we are at the beginning of uh, a very exciting uh, phase with the advent of the Internet of Things. We've already seen how uh, the mobile uh, revolutionized uh, you know, the country in many ways. And uh, subsequent to that, the advent of social media, analytics, cloud have thrown up a lot of interesting possibilities as well. Uh, now, the Internet of Things is a little bit different from these in the sense that in all of these uh, uh, technologies, there's a person at the end of the mobile or at the uh, PC or at the laptop. But in the Internet of Things, it's actually a communication between devices, between sensors and computers, and between computers and analytic tools at the back. Uh, and why this uh, raises the whole uh, bar and why it makes, uh, uh, it opens up uh, very exciting possibilities is that when you have uh, such ubiquitous spread of uh, sensors and uh, connectivity and computing capability all over, then the kind of possibilities that it opens up in, uh, for example, areas like agriculture, transportation, logistics, uh, traffic management, uh, healthcare, supply chain for food, etc., uh, is quite enormous. And when you combine that with the fact that today in India, in addition to all the IT capabilities that have been built over the last two decades, we have the fourth largest uh, ecosystem for innovation and uh, uh, product uh, development which is growing and in a couple of years time less than that in fact we will be the second largest ecosystem in the whole world so when you put all of these together the possibility of coming up with truly revolutionary and affordable solutions to many of the problems that have beset the country uh, really uh, stands out before us great so let me get you in here. Cisco is working very closely with the government on the smart city plan, for instance. That's one of the big ticket uh, things that the government is looking at to transform this, uh, you know, new delivery system, so to say. How far are we from actually adopting it? Uh, and um, what are the key takeaways from an Indian context? I think, uh, as Mr. Chandrasekhar already said, the, the beginning has happened. You know, we have made a start. And... Uh, we must realize we are at the beginning of this curve. And uh, I think what we are trying to do, we're trying to bring in the enablers, the technology, and we are working very closely with the entire ecosystem. And the government, of course, plays a very important role because uh, the key fundamentals to make it happen, are the first is the policy and regulation. The second is uh, the availability of the network, the basic, uh, call it railroad, you know, uh, that has to be there. And, then, and the third piece is the applications that are value adding. and. Uh, I think these three pieces have made a start. So from a Cisco standpoint, we're all excited to go out and work with the ecosystem. And what is important is uh, the service providers uh, have to come to the party. So it is the government, it's the service providers, and then it's the vertical specialists. I think what we're saying is value would be generated by increasing efficiency in vertical industry. May it be health, smart grid, or education, Look at all vertical industries. This ICT or the IOE is going to make them efficient. And that's where the uh, millions of dollars, billions of dollars will be extracted. And that's going to fund the further growth of this happening. And, and I think uh, 
We are very, very positive that is going to happen. So there, there are multiple pieces in this jigsaw, which is the Internet of Things. Okay, and I'm going to take a step back. Nigel and Ma, I'm going to ask you a, a basic question. What is driving the Internet of Things? Is it awareness? Is it smarter phones and gadgets which are able to, you know, carry a lot of lot more information? Or third, is it technology like cloud, like new new technologies that are allowing people to sift through data far more easier? What, what's driving it according to you? I, I think um, awareness is key. And, you know, here in India, we're aspirational. We quite often look to the West and see what consumers in the West are um, accessing on the internet. So we see them uh, participating in e-commerce, maybe watching video on demand, maybe um, ordering a taxi uh, uh, through an application, voice over internet uh, on, on their phone. So I think you know the user demand is coming from a huge awareness globally of uh, adoption and participation in the Internet of Things. Clearly handsets then and the smartphone uh, being delivered in huge quantities here uh, and consumed in huge quantities here in India is also driving that growth. So the, uh, the affordability of a, a smartphone handset is reducing month on month, uh, year on year. So that again creates some inertia and then technology in around that, very disruptive technologies coming in over the top services that are complementing that whole ecosystem. And I think that eclectic mix really is driving the bow wave of um, energy and appetite for the average Indian consumer. We are very, very aspirational here. You know, uh, disposable incomes are increasing uh, year on year and therefore I want more and I can access more through the internet. Is a, is a consumer, the end user driving it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think the digital literacy, uh, penetration of devices, all that, you know, Nigel talked about, but I think if you were to put it in a uh, contextual form, uh, there's equivalent for digital Maslow's hierarchy. And as people get to one layer, the aspiration goes to the next layer. And that's what it is now that, you know, you've gotten used to using a certain device, getting mobile internet, then the next question is, mm. what else can I get out of it? How can I get more value in the process out of it. Mr. Chandrasekhar, there is uh, hard numbers which is also uh, uh, being looked at when you look at the Internet of Things. And let's talk about the Indian software industry. What are the potential areas of growth? Because on one hand, you know, Internet of Things are transforming traditional businesses like automobiles, manufacturing, you know, banking, it's already transformed. On the other, it's also giving wings to the dreams of a lot of small businessmen who are being able to use the Internet now like never before. From NASCOM's point of view, where is the big potential and how do you see it evolving? We have an opportunity to come up with a lot of innovative solutions. And sector by sector, if you look at what the opportunities are, how do you make, for, how do you, for example, increase productivity in the agricultural sector? through a combination of sensors and uh, soil uh, uh, which, uh, which are able to measure various soil parameters and which are able to calibrate the kind of inputs that go into agriculture. How do you use these same uh, technologies and the Internet of Things to make the transport system more efficient or to reduce the enormous percentage of wastage uh, which takes place uh, in the transportation and resulting in the loss of a lot of the valuable uh, agricultural produce. Uh, so the same analogy applies uh, when you go into an area like uh, healthcare or when you go into traffic management. The list is endless. So I think that for the IT industry, because uh, today the capabilities which have been built over the last couple of decades have evolved continuously from just writing software to building entire IT, uh, IT uh, systems. And increasingly today, it is to deliver innovation and transformation of business processes. So given that this capability has been built up, the ability of the industry to put together the devices, the uh, applications, and indeed come up with comprehensive solutions, and particularly solutions which are tailored to meet Indian problems in Indian conditions, 
and at Indian price points opens up a fascinating array of possibilities uh, which I think will require innovation uh, to happen at a quantum level greater than what it is happening today. Right. Nigel, uh, you know what this also throws up is the tremendous potential for innovation. I'm mm. going to take off from what Mr. Chandrasekhar said. And it could create a hundred disruptors mm. <laughs> in the bargain. Mm. Are you already seeing that happening? Because we're seeing that, for instance, in the e-commerce space in India. Yeah, absolutely. Um, in the future, when people look at the next best thing in the Internet of Things, people will no longer look west, they will start to look east. You know, those disruptors now are coming in every single day. The startups in the Internet of Things is very much now an emerging market. Seeing problems in particularly my arena, which is communication, seeing problems in, in communicating and bringing a new app to disrupt that market and, 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 and solve a problem. So there are going to be a plethora of new technologies uh, being delivered out of emerging markets for emerging markets, looking at the infrastructure type, which is typically you know, 2G and edge technology, and looking at the handset types, which aren't the, you know, the high um, market value smartphones, but the more affordable smartphones with less processing speed, less battery strength, um, you know, just a, a typically uh, dumber uh, machine. That is where the huge disruptive new technology businesses are going to grow from. Now, you know what is interesting is in the last three years or maybe two years, you've seen uh, disruption already in play, right? That's right. We've seen retail get disrupted by e-com players. You've seen the way we buy groceries get disrupted <laughs> because of the, you know, many, many players that are filling that gap, where else are you putting your bet? How, how do you see this whole disruption working? Yeah, out? Before I come into the disruption, the question of size of the opportunity that you had asked to Mr. Chandrasekhar, I just want to have one sentence there. This is not about software or applications only. Uh, you know, in, in a rough estimate, we're talking about tens of billions of sensors or devices to uh, hundreds of millions of smart devices to possibly millions of software applications, which is going to transform the seven, seven and a half billion people, their lives and, and mm. touch their lives or whichever way you look at it. And it, it is true that, you know, the destination is all emerging markets, emerging economies and not so much for developed economies because of you know, various reasons, it's fairly penetrated, broadband and all that. But coming back to the innovation and the disruptions that you're talking about, you know, the, the uh, Deity policy paper talks about agriculture, energy and healthcare as the three uh, uh, verticals that they're initially focusing on. Uh, but to be honest with you, it, it's, government is only going to be an enabler in terms of providing the facilities. Mr. Modi's 100 smart cities or, or uh, you know, the, the digital enterprise or whatever he's talking about is only going to be enablers. Ultimately, the innovation is going to come from the user who is going to, and this is not about one big killer application, mm. where it's going to be thousands of mini killer applications, which is going to be like, like a micro segment solution. And, and that can only come from the segment that is actually having a pain. Sanjay, is this one area where the government has very little to do and you unleash the potential and it will get going on its own? Because, you know, to be fair, it had little to do with getting transportation on an app mm. or, or getting mm. a taxi service on an app. I mean, right. that was really right. uh, innovations that came from the need gap that there was. So I think what government does is, I mean, they make the right policy structure and the right regulations. I think, I mean, <clears throat> then the industry has to step up and do the job. And I think... I am pretty convinced, and you know, given uh, the innovation that has happened, I would say, last five years, we look at the mobile technology itself, I think that really calls for that there's going to be a, the innovation that we cannot dream today, that's going to happen in India, because India, the biggest issue is the affordability, right? Even if you get the right fundamentals in place, can you make it affordable so the, the rural India can enjoy it? Mr. Chandrasekhar, how big is the India story going to be for the technology software sector in India? I mean, a large part of the, your industry actually has looked out and not in uh, as a, uh, in terms of revenue. Is that going to uh, not change perhaps, but is that going to be increasingly more balanced out, you think, going forward? And uh, how is the, you know, the model of uh, engagement changing? Because we hear of a lot of the big four actually now looking at startups, at looking at new new areas of growth. How are you seeing the change out there? I think that uh, you know the uh, the domestic uh, market opportunity 
is uh, in some ways a, a tantalizing puzzle. Uh, it, is, uh, it is really uh, huge, it's right under the nose, uh, but yet there are uh, many uh, bar bar barriers and hurdles as well. Uh, I think the, on, the pro on the positive side, the emphasis uh, that the government uh, has uh, given to digital India and uh, to the uh, make in India is something which is certainly very positive. The belief that ICT uh, in particular and technology in general uh, is going to play a big role in uh, addressing India's problems is certainly something that the industry wholeheartedly endorses. But on the ground, there have been uh, many practical issues uh, governing uh, or which in some way have uh, retarded the participation of the industry or the exploitation of the capabilities that the industry has built in the migration to a digital India. Uh, we've seen lots of problems in the procurement in government. We've seen lots of problems in payment even after the procurement issues have been sorted out and after projects have been executed. And uh, many of these things are actually making companies quite wary. And in fact, the reality is that today uh, uh, many of the companies, uh, especially the large and medium companies, have a certain wariness and are in fact not even uh, bidding uh, for a number of government projects. A lot of small and medium companies have actually come to grief on account of projects that, have been, that, have, that they have implemented in the past. So therefore that story has not been a particularly happy one. But I think that, uh, you know, a dialogue is on with the government in terms of what needs to be done to address uh, those problems and bring the industry back uh, in full vigor uh, into the digital India because clearly an effort uh, that is uh, of this scale uh, cannot uh, really hope to succeed without the industry being involved uh, in a big way. What we haven't touched upon here is how the Internet of Things is going to change small business mm. as we know it. And, you know, SMEs, God knows, are 70 percent of India's industry. How do you see that panning out? And is that a big opportunity for anybody in the space? I think it's a huge opportunity. Um, <coughs> you know, the traditional small to medium sized business in India today doesn't really have a voice in the Internet of Things. I think there's about 48 million small to medium sized businesses in India. They actually contribute to 45% or over 45% of the output of India. They need to get into the Internet of Things and fixed line connectivity will probably help them to address that over time. That could be hugely transformational for them. I mean when I go around India now and I look at an average SMB, they don't have a website address on the front of the building. Typically, that's what happens in the West. Today, in India, it's a telephone number. Who knows, in two or three years' time, there's going to be a web address there mm. and probably a QR code and download our, our, our latest app. Mm. That's the pace of progress, and that's the opportunity for SMB. It's going to be a game changer. And, uh, and hugely improve their margins as well. I mean, because in many cases, it, it takes care of a lot of infrastructure costs, of completely. a lot of rollout costs. Yeah, completely. I mean, no longer in the, maybe the next three to five years do you need to be in a heavy footfall area. Because you're participating in the uh, e-commerce, you maybe can be in a, a, a more uh, backstreet sort sure. of area where you're warehousing um, uh, your uh, distribution. So, you know, great opportunity to increase margins, reduce headcounts, occupancy costs, and, and, and improve mm. profitability mm. generally. I want to have a last round of questions, Ravi. You know, in many senses, we could be at an inflection point. You know, mm. there is this awareness, there is this push of smartphones, there is this government push uh, in terms of uh, the policy, there is this push as far as industry and the disruptors and the innovators, everything is in place in the jigsaw of sorts. And what is also true is in the last three years, five years, we've seen technology disrupt business models, companies, and leaders in every industry. So I'm going to ask you to put your, stick your neck out and mm -hmm. tell me, in the next three years, as you know it, if Internet of Things progresses with the kind of push we've seen, mm -hmm. what do you think is going to change first in the scheme of things? First would, of course, uh, the, the, the piece will be to make the businesses efficient. You know, uh, 
And now it depends on which uh, vertical, I think we talked about many, which comes forward and embraces it. Because there's definitely a lot of cost saving in that, both from the CapEx and the OPEX. So, so I think that will be the first low hanging fruit to make my, if I participate in Internet of Things, I'm making my own business efficient. I'm generating enough cash so I can take a next leap in my business. Mm -hmm. I think that is kind of... Okay. Sure Ma, what do you think? Uh, it'll be kind of related to if you were to look at a larger business and see what is uh, the average spend per person or per family or whichever way. Uh, clearly, transportation, healthcare, and some of them in, in the semi-urban and urban societies are, are a lot higher spend. And those are the sectors that will uh, see benefits first. Okay. Mr. Chandrasekhar, where do you see the Internet of Things really making a change? Is it going to be in the government's delivery, when, which one hopes it's going to be, or is it going to be more led by business? Well, uh, in the government's uh, delivery, we are already uh, seeing, you know, uh, uh, beginnings which have been made in areas like uh, DBT and so on. But when you look at something like the Internet of Things, then I do believe that uh, uh, in addition to the areas which have been mentioned by some of the panelists, uh, energy is one uh, area where uh, we would probably see a rapid uh, proliferation of uh, uh, you know, uh, these kind of uh, technologies because our need is so great, our deficit is so high and the benefits of uh, adopting uh, such uh, technologies and control systems uh, would be would be far uh, higher. Uh, definitely, I think uh, we are seeing uh, initial science in uh, uh, areas like healthcare and in logistics. But the great big opportunity is in agriculture, and I think that uh, we just need uh, one or two, uh, you know, real uh, killer uh, applications which which will drive the whole sector. But I do want to add one more thing uh, because I would hate to. Uh, give an impression that, you know, everything is uh, perfect and things are uh, going to move ahead uh, at jet speed uh, uh, without uh, facing any problems. Uh, there are many concerns uh, which are, uh, which uh, would be there and as we move forward, uh, for example, there would be uh, concerns with regard to security and uh, privacy, uh, which become particularly acute when all these devices get connected and where many things get monitored 24-7 ubiquitously, uh, then some of these issues which are today, uh, you know, just murmurs uh, will become uh, even uh, stronger. Absolutely, Mr. Chandrasekhar. Last word from you, Nigel. I think um, productivity and efficiency uh, in, in both public and private sector is what will really um, come out of the Internet of Things. But I think particularly in public sector. So my key takeaway from this entire discussion is that we have perhaps only seen the tip of the iceberg on the Internet of Things, and the potential is tantalizing as long as we do it the right way. Okay, thank you so much for joining us.